Our speaker is Emmanuel Umubajesu. The title of this message is, My Encounter with Jesus. Let us pray. Father, we just thank you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. We bless your holy name, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Great I Am, the Everlasting Father. We give you all the glory, honor, adoration, majesty, and power, and dominion forever and ever you are the Lord. Speak your word, O Lord, today like never before. Minister to the needs of your people in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And let your name be lifted up and draw many souls unto yourself. And I give you the praise and I worship you. In Jesus' holy name. Amen. This Part of my life testimony is titled, My Encounter with Jesus. One day as I sat in my house, I hear the barrel of knocks on my door. I was very much annoyed. I wondered who on earth was so bold as to knock on my door. When I opened the door, it was a Christian woman who was the only tenant living in our house. Because that house belongs to my mother. It was my mother's property. When I saw this lady, my hair stood on my, uh, on my head. Every hair of my body stood on edge. My eyes reddened. And it seems as if I should kill the woman instantly or that I should cause the earth to swallow her alive for what she had done. The reason why I prohibited anybody from knocking on my door is because earlier on I had made a type of deadly sham which I brought to my room. Wherever such a sham is placed, it must of necessity be prohibited to knock on the door of such a, a, a room. Therefore, after I had got this sham, I called everyone living in that house, including the woman who came now to knock on my door. I gave all of them a strong warning never to come and knock on my door. I also called all of my uh, friends, those that were in the same occultic society together, I called them, and uh, I gave them the same strong warning. And uh, an English adage says, to be forewarned is to be forearmed. Now a long time has passed, and uh, nobody violated my strict order. But on this fateful day, when that woman came along, she did what nobody had ever done, ever since that warning. I mean, she knocked on my door against my orders. Hence, I concluded that it was a deliberate attempt to provoke me to fight her. As I opened the door to see the rebel, as this woman saw the, the look on my face, she quickly threw a paper that was already folded into my room and left I guess she was afraid or intimidated because of my look, the look on my face. But after she was gone, I slammed the door in fierce anger and decided to harm the woman by means of my native shams, by means of my medicine, which I call at that time a remote control, just to teach her the lesson of her life. Actually, I had been looking for a good chance to deal with this Christian woman in our house before this time. So it's like I wanted to roast her and eat her up and she had uh, put some butter on her body to stand by my fireplace. That's a kind of parable. She had earlier offended me on two different occasions, which she, I, I don't believe she was conscious of that, but I held those things in my, in my mind, in my heart. But uh, what were her offenses? 
There was another woman, a petty trader, who was selling bananas in the nearby market. I went to buy from this woman some bananas to be used in preparing some shams, some medicines, as a part of the recommendations for the uh, medicine that I want to prepare. It is necessary, it's of a necessity for me to ask for extra, like a gift from uh, the seller. Uh, Yoruba calls such extra in Fumini in. That means give me some extra. Whether I was given the extra or not is not the point of the matter, but I must ask. So I asked from the woman to give me extra, which she replied, calling me a thief. So I begged her and left her, yet determining in my heart to deal ruthlessly with her in return. Therefore, in order to punish her, I went and made a sham using her name, which I hung in the fireplace in my house. By, by, by the means of this sham, I had rendered this woman barren. If she ever got pregnant at all, her womb and stomach will become very hot, excessively hot, and such pregnancy will be terminated. And so she started to run from one hospital to another, from one native doctor to another, from one witch doctor to another, all to no avail. I was just mocking at her, and I was mocking at her fertile efforts, which she was putting in to be free from the bondage that I put her in. She even came to me on several occasions for help, <laughs> not knowing I was the very worst source of her problem. So I made sure I got plenty of money from her until her trade was ruined and she could no longer continue with the business. She had been going about with this sorrow in her life for about maybe seven years before she met this Christian woman, I mean the tenant in our house. The Christian woman started to preach to her, I guess. She started preaching to her, telling her something about her faith, about Jesus, and she would try to let her believe that Jesus can, uh, I mean, Jesus is the answer to all the problems of life and the only way to God and the rest of it. And oftentimes I do see this lady coming into our house to visit this uh, uh, lady that was living in our house, this, the, the banana seller, due to come into our house to visit this other lady. Then, I just pretended as if I did not notice either of them, and I was mocking them. I go about my own business. Sooner, they became very tight friends, and the woman who had the problem agreed to be attending the women's fellowship meetings in the, in the church of this Christian woman. Then, their friendship grew stronger within a short period, and for about three months, they continued together in attending the church fellowship and prayers regularly, one calling the other while going, beside the usual group fellowship in the church, the two women oftentimes would fix a meeting in our house and conduct overnight prayers. I said to myself, let them continue doing whatever they like. They don't understand what they are doing. They are only joking. But after they had prayed like this for some time, to my utter dismay, I discovered one day that red ants, which Yoruba language in Nigeria called Ijalo had collected on those shams that I made to affect that woman. This is an indication that it had been spoiled. It has no effect on the woman anymore. I became furious. I said, so this woman calling Jesus Jesus in our house every night have spoiled my sham eventually? They will see something. They will pay for it, I promised. So I went and made another sham more terrible than the former. This second sham I buried in a plantain banana, I mean, in a, in, a, in, a, in a plantain plantation, or banana plantation, deep inside one jungle on the outskirts of the city of Ibadan. Ibadan is the largest city in West Africa, and Ibadan is in Nigeria, which is today the capital of uh, or your state of Nigeria, where no man could uh, have 
any ready access to the sham was so terrible in effect because the way I made it, as long as bananas or plantains are being uh, harvested in any form, anywhere in the world, in, in, in every year, such a woman will remain barren. But if no one in the whole world ever harvest banana or plantain throughout a year, if this was possible, then the problem will be solved. Otherwise, her problem remained with her. However, this woman, having now put her faith in Jesus Christ, continued to pray without losing heart. Again, to my utter disgust. I just discovered one of the days that a bulldozer, a tractor, came along and cleared that jungle, uprooting all the bananas and planting trees together with my shams, of course. I later learned that the then Western Region government, which is now made up for Oyo, Ogunwondo, Lagos States, and Bendel, had declared that area set aside for a government project, and so the jungle had to be cleared. However, after I had become a Christian, I began to understand that if God wants to rescue his own children, he moves in, in a mysterious way. The facts about, about, about uh, I mean, about this case, that is, the, 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 the facts became clearer to me that uh, the, the government of heaven, seeking to free this woman from the bondage of Satan, which I have put her in, motivated the Western region government to acquire the jungle and clear my shams off. Uh, here, let us read uh, uh, Romans chapter 13, okay? Romans chapter 13, Romans the 13th chapter, and we will read the first verse, okay? Take your Bible right now, if you have one around you, and uh, let us quickly uh, get, have a glance of that. The 13th chapter of the book of Romans, and the first verse. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Hallelujah. Whosoever therefore resisted the power, resisted the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. Okay, what I'm saying here is, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. So when this uh, incident happened, I concluded that it was the Christian woman tenant again who advised the other woman to be praying in the manner they did. Hence, I held her responsible for spoiling my shams on those two occasions and promised that she must one day pay very dearly for her actions. All these decisions I took were unknown to them. Either one of the ladies known that I have taken such a decision to punish them both. I said to myself, well, I have tied someone down and this Christian woman released her from bondage through her prayers. I must take my revenge on her one day. This was how the tenant uh, woman offended me. So, on that fateful day, when she be began, uh, I mean, when she banged on my door, she banged on my door, bang, 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 knocking on my door. My long-awaited opportunity eventually arrived. At that time in question, I had a native sham, a medicine, a demonic power made from the blood of 201 black cats. It was a waste, a waste band. Yoruba call that kind of sham, that kind of medicine. In Yoruba language, they call it onde or ononde. With the sham, with this kind of medicine, I could kill anybody without even having to meet them in person. Or I can make them sick without having any physical contact with them whatsoever. It could be used in many other situations. For example, if there was a conflict or even a war between two villages or two groups of peoples or two nations, and you go to the war front with this sham on you, it will make you invisible. 
There are some incantations and enchantments that you can render, and this thing makes you invisible. If you then draw closer to the enemy's territory and strike the ground with the sham three times, saying the appropriate incantations, Almost immediately, all types of bananas and plantains trees will sprout out from nowhere all over the area with ripe fruits on them. Now, if a person from the enemy camp comes along feeling so hungry and he took any of these fruits, he has taken a deadly poison. There are yet many other ways this sham or this medicine could be used, but... The best way I had often put the sham to use is this. I'm going to tell you. Four nails. You get nails, okay? Nails. You have four nails. And these four nails are put on the wall with the topmost, the topmost one of those nails being about 13 inches away from the nearest of the set of the other three nails remaining, which are separated from each other by two shorter gaps. All the four nails are arranged vertically downwards. If I wanted to use the sham to cause body ache to somebody, I will first hang the sham on the top nail and then draw the lower end of it down to hang it on the first of the three nails beneath. If to cause somebody to be fainting frequently, it will be drawn to the second nail. But if it was to kill instantly, I would draw that nail down to the last nail, which is the fourth one in the row. Initially, I decided to harm the woman directly with this sham. But upon second thought, I reasoned that it would pain her more if I would punish her indirectly by attacking one of her children. Therefore, after I had called the name of the little boy, after I have called his name, uh, the, uh, the, the youngest of her children, which was a boy, uh, to the sham, with the appropriate incantations and enchantments, I drew the, the, the waistband to the first nail. Immediately, the child cried aloud to his mother for help. When she observed that the condition of the child had changed, she also cried for help. There was a, a, a witch doctor whose house was next to our house. The man ran inside and brought a liquid medicine for the woman to use. The woman told the uh, witch doctor bluntly, Sorry, sir, I cannot use that medicine because Jesus Christ is sufficient for me. Then the herbalist says, If Jesus Christ was sufficient for you, why then did you cry for help? The woman said, I cried for help from Jesus and not from a man. So the woman replied back, so the man went away in shame. Because the, the woman made the man realize, she made the witch doctor realize that Jesus Christ was sufficient for her. Meanwhile, I was watching this woman in a magic crystal ball in my room. And I could hear all the uh, all their uh, discussions, all what they were saying, all what she was saying to the witch doctor, and what the witch doctor was replying back. I could hear everything, but they could never see me, nor hear me. Then I also stood up, carried a dreadful medicine, a concoction, which Yoruba called Agbo in Yoruba language, and uh, I went to her. I went to this lady, and I told her, I heard you cry for help. And I have come to help you. So let us quickly use this thing for your child who is dying. I added. I knew that if her son partook of the medicine, he would be healed because I was the one who bound him. And I will go and lose him, but the same medicine will make him to catch an incurable tuberculosis. But again, this woman refused bluntly to use the medicine for her son. She replied with a Yoruba proverb saying, being interpreted, anybody running after two bush rats simultaneously will end up killing neither one of them. She said that uh, she could therefore not have Jesus and then depend on shams again. Right there, I started to curse her with a sham, saying, Your son will surely die because you refuse to use my medicine. 
The woman replied with all confidence. She said, Because Jesus lives forever, my son will not die. Each time I cursed her that her son will surely die, she firmly replied back that Jesus is alive forevermore, and so her son must also live. When all efforts to force her to use my medicine failed, I tried to provoke her to anger. I said, You are a total fool, a compound fool, because you refuse to use my medicine for your son. But she did not even give me any reply anymore. So I left her in shame, and uh, I left her room and thought I was also sent away. I mean, disgusted, wondering in my mind, in my heart, what kind of a woman, what kind of a person is this? On returning to my room, I continued to watch this woman and her son in my magic ball. She removed her hair tie and Tying it around her waist, she continued to pray with such a fervent zeal. I've never seen anyone like that before. I was just mocking her. Even though she's doing something or some things to amaze me, I was still mocking her. Both her actions and words of prayers, I was mocking her. She prayed vigorously like this for a long time. When she started to grow weak, she called her daughter who was the eldest child, and sent her to go and call their church evangelist. The name of the girl she called was Bosede, a Bosede. I laughed loudly in my room and said, Oh, so you are now calling another savior? You are no longer calling on that Jesus? I will see that you are Jesus today. As the little girl stepped out of the house, I too quickly entered one magical circle in my room purpose for doing that was that I evoked out a very wicked demonic spirit and I ordered him to go and strike the girl dead. Then I said, the sick boy at home is a problem unsolved. Then the dead girl will be an added sorrow. So go and strike the girl dead. But the demon threw a question to me and I will never forget. He just asked me a, a simple question, and he said, What evil has the girl done? So he refused to carry out my orders. He declined to go. The girl went, and within ten minutes, the evangelists arrived at the scene with other youths from their church. As soon as they stepped into the woman's room, nobody asked any question, but instead they all started praying for the sick child. Eventually, the lady asked, I mean, the, 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 the evangelist, the evangelist, he asked the lady, what is wrong with your child? But the lady said, well, I cannot tell you. All I can say is that you should pray. Because I don't want to tell you. If I tell you, I might create some fear into your heart. And where there is fear, there is no faith. So I want our faith to work together. That's a lesson right there. So if you are a Christian today and you are afraid of your life, you are afraid to face the reality of life. Hey, just see, there's going to be failure because uh, fear and faith, they don't work together. One thing I noticed in the, in the, in the, um, in on that day was that the voice of their prayer was like a great waterfall. As they prayed, it seemed to me as if they were all simply saying, Jesus, 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 Jesus. I did not hear anything apart from Jesus. I sat looking at them and wondering, because I was looking at my crystal ball. I was seeing them there, everyone in that room. I can see them from my room. Then I began to question in my, in, in my mind, what type of people are these? I tied somebody down in my room here, and they are calling on Jesus to come and free him in their own room out there. Who is this Jesus? To losing the person I have tied down? Today, I will see that Jesus. Let him dare to come and lose in the body. I said, little did I know, little did I know that I was prophesying on that day when I said, I will see that Jesus. Little did I know I was prophesying. As I watched them from my ball, I also kept a vigilant eye on my sham on the wall. 
when their prayer had grown very hot, I looked up and to my surprise, the lower nail to which I hooked the waistband was pulling out gradually. I therefore took a hammer and nailed it back into the wall. I went and sat down again to continue watching them from my magic ball. To my surprise again, no sooner had I sat down than the nail flung out of the wall entirely and I was unable to trace out its whereabouts. This made me the more angry. I then drew the sham to the second nail after calling the name of the child with incantations and the child fainted. They never relaxed in their prayers, and nobody even opened his eyes or her eyes to see how it was going with the child. They just kept on calling, Jesus, 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 Jesus. The voice of their prayer went up higher and higher and higher and higher. The second nail also got removed out of the wall, and besides that, it broke a magic mirror hanging on the opposite wall in the room. The mirror was a locally made one. I got it from the uh, occult uh, body society known as Egbe Awile. They are usually referred to in Yoruba land as Egbe Omabile Sorokile Lano. Egbe Awile means the cult of the earth. Anyway, and this satanic mirror has no other use than to kill people. When you call somebody into the mirror through incantations and enchantments and the medium, he must appear, no matter what chance he has or what powers he depends on. If he turns his back to you in the mirror, it means that you can't kill him or harm him. However, if a person appears facing you directly and you talk to him with incantations, that person will surely die. The Lord Jesus knew that my waistband will certainly fail and that I will then come to the mirror to use the mirror. So he first broke the mirror out before destroying the waistband. When my mirror broke, I said loudly, These people have done their worst, and now I will do mine. So I finally called the names of both the mother and the, ch and the child with incantations and drew the sham down to the last nail remaining. Immediately, both the mother and the child fell down dead. They were dead. When the preacher, the evangelist, heard the fall, he opened his eyes to see what had happened. On seeing both the mother and the child dead, he and his colleagues stopped praying. He removed his coat. He was having his jacket on. He removed it. Then I said immediately in my room, Did you remove your coat? You will also remove your pants also. You will remove your pants. What brought you here to come and murder a woman and her son? You will definitely explain yourself to the government, I concluded. And I thought they were going to fail on that day so that I could report an alleged murder case to the law enforcement authorities. But God brought up his glory and he glorified himself. Jesus never fails. Don't, don't forget. After removing his coat, he said, Now, I alone will pray. And he instructed the youths within him, I mean with, with him in the room, that they should say amen when necessary. But every, otherwise, everybody should keep quiet. So he started praying. He started to pray. He prayed aloud. And this is a part of what he said, okay? This is a part of what he said, okay? He said, Lord God of hosts, you are the Lord, and beside you there is no other Savior. I thank you for the good promises in your word, the Bible. You said in your word that thou will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusted in thee. Again, O Lord, your word says, surely, you shall deliver us from the snare of the fowler. And again, there shall be no evil that will befall thee. Again, you said that you are the God of all flesh. There is nothing impossible unto you. Even this woman and her son, who are now dead, 
it is not impossible for you to raise them up. So, you said you are the Lord, you change not. Lord, Lord, I believe that you are truthful. You are a righteous God. Your word says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him. And without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life. And the life was the light of men, and the light shineth in darkness. And the darkness comprehended it not. In his prayer, the man quoted the scriptures as if he was a co-author of the Bible with God. After these words, he stopped. He, he was quiet about a minute, which is about 60 seconds. After, the man threw a question to God, and the answer from God to that question brought confusion, a total confusion to the evil forces and power that was in me or in my, ho in my house. And this was the question he asked God. He said, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus Christ, shall darkness comprehend your power? Meaning that, Lord Jesus Christ, will Satan overcome your name? Thank God. Thank God. Ooh, hallelujah. Jesus did not delay for a moment before he sent his reply down. Because he does not want any stain on his precious name. Immediately. After this question was asked, there was a lot of confusion in my room. Then I heard a snap sound and I looked up. The waist sham, the waist band, was cut into two equal halves. So neatly as if it was cut with a sharp razor. When I noticed that the sham had cut... I cried aloud in deep sorrow considering the troubles and sufferings I underwent before the sham was made. However, the woman and her son came back to life. The evangelist said to her, The war is now over. Stand up. Go and take your bath. And bathe your son also. I was greatly annoyed and sorrowful. I then decided to know the person who sent the woman to me to throw shams into my room so that I may deal more ruthlessly with him or her. I inquired from my magic ball, from my crystal ball, who was the, uh, the person that sent this woman to me to throw this sham in my room because the paper she threw in my room, I thought it was a sham to harm me with. What I saw in the crystal ball intrigued me. I saw a man appear whose eyebrows were just like the rainbow, his eyeballs like the sunrise, and as his clothes, I cannot form words, no vocabulary to describe it. Let me just call it glory. I kept on looking at him, my mouth agape. Finally, I asked him, Who are you? And he replied, I am the Lord Jesus Christ who died for your sins. Believe me, and thou shalt be saved. I then shouted at him, Get out of here! Otherwise I will show you that man pass man, and position pass power. I threatened him more, but he just laughed. I grew wild the more. I asked him, Don't you know me? Have you never heard about me? I'm talking to you and you are laughing? You want to die? So I decided to kill him instantly. I took one liquid sham, like liquid iodine, that's what it, it, it was like, to throw on the figure on my ball. But to my surprise, the liquid became solidified, and my hands were hung up in mid-air so that I could neither raise them up nor lower them down. I kept on struggling to free myself while the man in the magic ball was just laughing at me. In annoyance, I kicked the magic ball with my feet and broke it. Then I went and took another uh, uh, ball, though it's like a pendant. We call it crystal gazing, to inquire the same thing as before. And when I make my inquiries, I also saw Jesus Christ. And I said, get away. You are the Lord of yourself. I'm the Lord of my own house. 
Why should you keep on saying that you died for me? I then broke that uh, crystal gazing also. After this, I came to my senses and said, instead of destroying all my great articles, all my great powers, it were better I first destroy the sham that this woman brought into my room, for I was thinking the, the, the paper she threw in my room was a sham. I therefore decided to, to know the type of medicine which the woman threw into my room so that I could neutralize it or neutralize the power that was in the sham. So I took the paper, which I supposed was the sham, by, 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 the, by my left hand I took it, chanting the incantation that could render the medicine powerless. So I unwrapped the, the, the roll. I continued to sing another song with the words of incantations. When I was satisfied and, and, uh, and I opened up the paper, there was nothing like powder found in it. There was nothing like ring, like uh, amulet, except the words that were written, revival, revival, revival. Then the venue followed, the time, the date. Then he continued to say, the blind see, the lame walk, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and we have the gospel preached to the poor. I read this inscription and laughed like a madman. I mean, I laughed to scorn. I wondered and I said, oh, is this why I broke all my precious apparatus, all my precious articles? Is this what caused this woman to suffer herself and her son so much to the point of death? Besides, I added, the man who printed this, this handbills, this flyer, is a complete fool. Why is he campaigning about raising the dead when, after all, I used to raise up the dead in invocation? At any time, while performing magical shows, he is now printing leaflets that uh, he can raise the dead. If he knows he can raise the dead, why don't he enter into the hospital and uh, command the mortuary to be opened, if he can, and uh, just command all the dead people there to get out of the place? Then I said further, even the woman who brought the leaflets is a fool, because she was sent to the dead, the blind, the deaf, and the crippled. Why then did she come to me? Well, I fail to realize that anybody living in unbelief is blind to the mysteries of God. Anybody who is not walking in the ways of Jesus Christ is a cripple. Uh-huh. Oh, for sure, he's a cripple. Anybody who cannot walk in the ways of Jesus Christ is a cripple. Then I said to myself that day, I said, eh, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. I'll go to, this, to the very revival ground uh, at night to show the man something. My purpose of going to that revival was not to hear the gospel of peace, but to harm the preacher. You see? You see what, <laughs> what, what evil that is awaiting preachers out there? So if you are a preacher and you're listening to this, what I'm saying, I'm, I'm telling you that the battle has to be won on your knees before you go out there to witness about Jesus Christ. If you are a prayerless Christian, you are a powerless Christian. If you are too busy to pray, you will be too busy to live a holy life. Okay? So I repeat that again. My purpose of going to that crusade ground that night was not to hear the gospel, but to, to, to harm the preacher. When the evening came, eventually, I went to the revival ground. However, I did not mingle with the crowd, but instead I stayed in a dark, isolated, a little distance from the congregation. There, I tried all I could to disgrace the preacher by means of evil spirits and native shams, but all efforts proved to be abortive. It was all in vain. To begin with, I ordered some demonic spirits to stand on guard round about me and ensure that nobody passes through that area. I told those demons that I wanted to walk on the evangelist that was preaching there. And I started the walk right away. I called the demonic spirit. In the demonic world, he is known as Jehoholahi. He is in the charge of fire in the kingdom of Satan. It is this demonic spirit that fire eaters and Shango worshippers who carry fire have to appease before they, they can perform that kind of uh, magic. So from him, and uh, they obtain the power to overcome 
uh, any earthly fire, but know for sure that the fire from heaven has no antidote, okay? The, the hell fire has no antidote, so there's no incantation that can subdue that. I told this demon, go to the midst of those people and cause any of their electrical appliances to spark fire or let the life wires of the lighting touch. Do anything you can to cause a big fire so that some people will, will, be, will be burnt and get hot. Go forward, I commanded. He took three steps forward and then he stopped. What's wrong? I asked. He replied that he couldn't proceed any further than, than that. Why? I questioned. He then called me to come and see. Then I used my inner, inner eyes, so I too moved forward to look. However, it's not with the natural eyes, okay? I told you, I used my inner eyes. I looked into it. He asked me what it was. What did you see? What could you see there? I replied, it was fire. I can see a bunch of fire out there. Then he said, that fire you see is the fire that consumes fire. Actually, the fire was like the fire of an extraordinary furnace, and it encycled the whole congregation, then extending for several meters in diameter. The flames went skywards indefinitely. So, this demon told me that he could not go. I rebuked him, saying, But you are fire yourself. Why are you afraid of fire? He said, It is not like that. It's not like that. And he repeated his earlier assertion. That fire you see out there, that fire you are looking at, is the fire that consumes fire. I shouted at him and gave him license to depart immediately. Then I, I evoke another demon to carry out the assignment. But he responded with a question. He asked, you had sent someone who couldn't go. How can I go? Then I sent him away also. Then I called the fourth of the superior spirits, the fourth person in, this, uh, in the superior go spirits government, in the government of Satan, whose name is Belial. Anywhere you see some people gathering, holding a meeting or dance party, and later they started fighting using chairs or, or their benches or sofas to whip up themselves. Perhaps they cut each other or stab each other with knives or broken bottles. It is the spirit of Belial, the demonic spirit who has visited them. That is his own function in the satanic order, to cause quarrels, to cause confusion, be it in the family, among friends, or even in a community. Then I commanded uh, Belial to go forward, walk on them, and let them start fighting. I said to myself, after all, they call themselves revivalists. When they start beating each other with benches, with uh, wires and the rest of it, the newspaper will carry it in the headlines the next day, that a revival turns to a free-for-all fight. Carry on, come on, I commanded the demon. He too took a few quick steps and then stopped. What's wrong again? I inquired. He asked me to come and see, and I moved in to look again. This time, it was no longer fire I saw, but it was blood. The whole place looked like as if it were an abattoir, where millions of animals have been freshly slaughtered. It was as if all the people were totally immersed in the flowing river of, of, of the blood. He asked me, what could, what could you see there? And I replied to him, blood, blood, it looked like blood. He told me pointedly, that is the blood of the Lamb of God. But since I didn't understand him, I asked him again, mocking, you mean that God has a sheep and that he killed it and the blood of it is now frightening you? Is that what you are saying? I too have a sheep at home. I will kill it for you later so that you can uh, drink the blood. He said, it is not like that. He said firmly, that is the blood of the Lamb of God who taketh away the sins of the world. He added, nothing in this world, nothing in this world, or in any depth, 
can face that blood in combat. So he bluntly refused to go, and I chased him off also. When I realized those demons could not help me carry out my assignment, I resorted to using my already prepared native charms. I recited a very powerful incantations, and when I finished it, I commanded that the evangelist should fall down dead on the, on the platform. Just then, he jumped up joyfully and asked the congregation to shout, Hallelujah! The shout was almost deafening. So whenever I gave the command in my dark hideout for the man to drop dead, he, is, he instead responded with the joyful shouts of, Hallelujah! I concluded that the, the, the man was mad for failing to obey my orders. And I, I, I don't even know why my shams could not work on him. However, the, 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 I mean, his sermon that he was preaching that night started to hit me like a catapult stones, like a slingshot. Started to hit me, pinching my heart like a needle and washing my heart like a bleach. At this very stage, the evangelist stopped, pointed in my direction as if he can see me, though I know he cannot see me physically, that might probably be a, a, a discernment in the spirit, and asked the congregation to pray. And he said, there is a dark power around here. Pray that God will lighten that darkness, that there should be light in it. They all prayed at once, and the evangelist also prayed. What happened? A big flash of light came out of the mouth of that evangelist and disappeared into heaven. On returning, it was accompanied by all forms of weapons of war, all rushing towards me. Beside that, I was encycled by a very bright light, much brighter than the sun at noon. Though I was the only one seeing these things, yet, it seemed to me as if everybody in the congregation was looking at me and was seeing every wicked thing I was doing in the, wicked, in, in, I mean in the, in the darkness out there. Then, an almost unbelievable thing happened to me. For the first time, I became afraid. As those weapons got closer, I ran for my dear life. Anybody who saw me running that night will wonder what on earth was making me run. But as for me, I knew what was chasing me. When I could no longer see those dreadful weapons of war anymore and those soldiers, I turned and went back to the crusade ground. I said to myself, that man, that is the evangelist, must surely die today, today, he must die. However, by the time I got back to the crusade ground, the summer was over. And the crowd had dispersed, but the evangelist and his colleagues were busy packing up their equipment. I went straight to him and shook his hands. My intention for shaking his hands with him, shaking hands with him, because in those days I only shake hands with my enemies. My, 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 my intention for shaking hands with him was to cause his hands to be withered. I want, him, or I want him to become crippled in his hand. I greeted him in Yoruba language. I said, Ekwisha meaning, wishing you more grace to your elbow in the work of God. Then I challenged him, Sir, you are not doing the will of my mother. This is a kind of incantation, meaning that he is, he is going against the wishes of the witchcraft, and he is not obeying them, nor, nor give, paying homage or respect to them at all. I started pouring incantations on him face to face. When I finished, I commanded him to start sleeping. Which means, in other words, if, if he ventures to fall asleep, he's dead. He's a dead man. So I commanded him to start sleeping. He replied to me so calmly and said, Gentlemen, Jesus neither sleeps nor slumbers. In answer to his reply, I gave him a dirty slap on his face. I said, I ask you to be sleeping. You are saying Jesus does not sleep. What concerns me, Jesus? What concerns Jesus with me? Am I speaking to Jesus or am I speaking to you? The evangelist never retaliated. I expected him to beat me or hit me back, but he never did retaliate. But he just remarked again, just as calmly as before, you are an instrument for God's use. Oh, I flared up again upon hearing that. 
because I considered it that he was cursing me at that time. I pointed to his face, touching his nose, shouting at the top of my voice, You are the one God will use. You are the one God will use. All my attempts to provoke him to fight were met by his gentleness. When I did not know what to do again, I left him still, shouting what I thought to be a cause, that he is this instrument for God's use. I wept bitterly. I left him and I went home. That was my first encounter with Jesus. Our speaker is Emmanuel Umu Bajesu. The title of his message is My Conversion. You want to say after me, devil? Yeah. This is my Bible. This is my I am what my Bible says that I am. I am not what my Bible says I am not. I can do what my Bible says I can do. I can have what my Bible says I can have. Devil, I want you to know also, you are what my Bible says that you are. And you cannot do what my Bible says you cannot do. And you cannot have what my Bible says you cannot have. You are a liar. That's why I never believe you. A murderer. That's why I never trust you. But Jesus came to die for me. That I will be saved. And that's what I want. And the Bible says I am saved. So I believe I am saved. And that's why I am blessed. I can never be caused. In Jesus name. Amen and amen. Glory to God. Glory. Glory. God is good. God is good. How many of you believe God is good? Amen, amen and amen. Tonight, God has laid it on my heart to share with you the testimony of my conversion, how I become a Christian. Because I wasn't from a Christian home or from a Christian family. A lot of you are blessed enough I don't want to use the word lucky. I don't believe a Christian is lucky. Okay? Yeah. I don't believe that a Christian is lucky. Yeah. I believe a Christian is blessed. Before I become a Christian, I was practicing the art of wish doctor. And I was practicing as a magician. And I, I had practiced four different kinds of magic. But before we go into those things, I want us to get prepared for what the Lord has for us for tonight. So shall we bow our heads in prayers, please? Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. For the Lord God omnipotent reigneth, let the earth tremble before him. Heavenly Father, we acknowledge your holiness. We acknowledge your righteousness. We acknowledge your Holy Spirit and the presence of your Holy Spirit in this place. And so we want to thank you, Lord Jesus, for taking it upon yourself to come into this world of sin, to shed your blood, that we will be ransomed and be redeemed from our lost world. And that we will be transformed from darkness into the light. We just want to give you the glory. Heavenly Father, it could be there are some souls here tonight who claims to know you but they have never known you. It could be there are some that are still searching and looking for where to find you. And there are some also who actually knows you but could not rely on what you are for them. Let it please your holy will, O oh Lord, as I minister in these testimonies, that every needs will be met. Turn our world upside down unto your glory. And let's be a worker 
to the expansion of your kingdom. Take the glory to yourself, Father. Give us the blessings. And let the kingdom of darkness have the shame. And exalt your word above your name. So that your name will be glorified. In Jesus' precious name. And all the saints say, Amen and Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let's see here the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. Luke. The 19th chapter. St. Luke, the 19th chapter. Now I'd like for us to read verse 9 and verse 10. And Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come to this house. For so much as he also is the son of Abraham. For the son of man is come to seek, S-E-E-K, not S-I-C-K. For the son of man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. And the question is, has he been able to find you? The Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. Has he been able to find you? I'm a Nigerian. Nigeria is located on the west coast of Africa, on the Atlantic Ocean, about 10 degrees north of equator and about five degrees of the Greenwich line. So if you want to check out in your map, you know uh, where you can find that. In Nigeria, before I become a Christian, there are 10 different kinds of secret societies which in your own language you, you, you use the word occult. But um, when I begin to check out from the dictionary what the word occult means, the word occult does not necessarily mean evil. The word occult means society. But where the word occult will denote evil is why you say secret occult. The Christians, the Christian bodies are in an open occult, not secret one. We're in an open occult, which means whosoever will may come. But there are some of these bodies, there are some of these occult bodies that are operating in secret place. For instance, the Rosicrucian Order, the Freemasonry, the Eastern Stars, and the rest in the list. So in Nigeria, before I become a Christian, the secret occultic bodies in Nigeria that was registered under the government of Nigeria under the pretense of a fraternal body were ten different kinds of secret occultic bodies. Ten different kinds of them that were registered under the laws of Nigeria. And what these people does is to register under the law so that they could be protected by the law. And then, but when they get into their assembly hall, they practice every kind of atrocities. For instance, the Universal Church of Satan here in the United States, they are, they were, they are covered by, the, by your law, covered under your constitution. They have the right to choose. They have the right to worship whatever, whatever they want to worship. And that organization is even registered under the laws of the United States. I mean, the Church of Satan. But from what we've been hearing from these Satanists, you realize that 
They've been going too far, destroying the souls and homes and lives of people. I was in Chicago early this year when a lady was testifying in a church in Chicago that she was a breeder to the Satanists. If you want to know what I mean by a breeder, she will have to deliberately get conceived, get pregnant, give birth to the, to, to the child so that the child could be used in rituals by the Satanists. Now, why is Satan doing this to the race of man? I want us to examine that before I share with you how I become a Christian. Why would Satan want to do this? Take, for instance, about 15 years ago or so, 1973, if I'm precise, the laws of your land approved abortion in this country. The laws of your land gave the right to a woman, whether with or without the consent of the husband, has the power to abort a child. Fifteen years later, you begin to see, in your own language you call them abortion homes, okay? But in my own language I call them slaughter homes. Fifteen years later, you begin to see a lot of slaughter homes built around you. And people are making wealth out of this. Specialists in soul destruction. Specialists in life destructions. Why is Satan doing this to us? The reason is simple. If you want to destroy a species, get the eggs of those species and destroy them. Sterilize their eggs and they will be completely destroyed. Our children are our eggs. So the devil wants to destroy the race of human beings on the face of the earth and the, 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 the best way for him to do that is by destroying our children. So what I'm saying is you being a believer you have a great deal of responsibility and you've got to be watchful. Now in those days before Christ came into my life I was such a horrible, horrible person. People fear me, and that, that was what I want in those days. If I go to a cinema theater to, to watch a film, that was before I become a Christian. If I go to a cinema theater to watch a film, because I was so evil and wicked, you will find more than 20 people that wanted to pay for my ticket. Why? Because over there, you have to struggle to get a ticket because the crowd was too much. So what I do is to put spell on the people. Then they give way for me. I can go there without struggle to get my ticket. When the people realize that's what I used to do, they, nobody want me to put spell on them. So they say, oh, you're here, professor, you're here. Because I was known... As, as, as a professor, but not a professor of uh, any university degree, but a professor in magic. Oh, you are here, professor. Okay, don't worry. You just stay here. I'll bring your ticket for you in a minute. More than 20 people will come to do that. Because if they don't, I'm going to let them pay for it. I put spell on the people and do every kind of atrocities. And the Police cannot arrest me. It comes to a stage that if you go to the police or you pick up your phone and you call the police, oh, there is a problem here. There is one man that is causing some problems and the rest, and you blah, 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 blah. And they're going to ask you, do you know the man? Do you know his name? 
Once you say it is bag of wickedness or you say it is Professor Shankar, they tell you, oh, we're sorry, we're not coming there. Honestly. Because they have tried everything they think they can do to suppress me or to take my powers from me, but they were unable. They did not succeed. A lot of times they put me in, in, in a police cell. A lot of times they put me in prison. I never stay there. I will disappear from the prison, from the police cell, go back home. And I can come back tomorrow morning and say, whom do you put in your prison yesterday? They become terrified. I can get in there and take some few policemen and put them into a big torment. My masters in those days, in magic, magical occultism, they estimated my contact or power supply in the spirit realm to about one milliwatt. Which, I don't know, I don't know how many millions that I, can, that, I, that I can put that of electricity. That is, if I were to be an electricity generator, I would be able to supply a kind of electricity that will, that will feed or, or, or serve the whole of Illinois State. If I were to be a generating plant that will generate electricity, I would be able to supply the power that will serve the whole of Illinois State. So even my masters were afraid of me because they believed that my meditation is so pure and so concentrating and I could be looking at you just like that in those days even though you will see some symbols on my body I could just be looking at you like that and I'll be tormenting you like that without touching you at all. That was the kind of life I used to live. Then it came to a stage that I thought I was something. I remember, and this I will never forget, I always share with brethren. I remember there was a political uproar, and I was a leader of a gang. And we began to cause some problems in the society. And the government drafted some police into that place to keep peace. Then I have got this dangerous medicine on me. And I hit those policemen with them, six of them. And as soon as I hit them with this dangerous thing, they were unable to move their uniforms from their bodies. Their uniforms were gummed to their bodies. They can't take it off. Reason back home in the western area where I come from, they have a kind of incantation that says that it is only death that can remove the, the skin in the leg of a fowl. So, when this happened to this policeman, because they will be feeling excessive heat in their bodies, by so doing, they will be trying to take their uniforms off, but they can't take it off. And I know, as soon as I hit them with this dangerous thing, they cannot last another week. They're going to die. And when this happened, they went back to their station and complained to their masters, and their masters has dragged in some other policemen, paramilitary policemen. They had come in and they started fighting, shooting tear gas and the rest of it, and each one of them I hold just like that, they are gone. Each one of them I hold, they are gone. And when the rest of them saw what was happening, they fled, they ran away. Then the government now sent soldiers and they told these soldiers to take me dead or alive. 
And when these soldiers came in, and one of them began to point to me, yes, that's the man, that's the man, that's the man. And they came in. And I told this young man that led those soldiers, he was a major in rank, and I called him by his name, and he said, who told, me, who told you my name? I said, Godwin, I know whatever I want to know. Then I told him his mother's name too. Oh, what kind of a person are you? Oh, I said, you forgot what the government asked you to come and do here, do you? You were asked to come and take me dead or alive. And now you are here struggling with words. I said, but you know what? I have killed more men than your eyes have ever seen. Do you want to die? And he goes, who do you think you are? Then he brought out his uh, machine gun, cock it up. I said, Godwin, I'm very sorry for you, but I don't want to kill you. But don't shoot that gun. He pulled the trigger. I collected those bullets. I gave them back to him. I said, you want to try something else? Oh. He just fell off. He collapsed. He was so shocked. He couldn't believe his eyes. That you can point a machine gun to a human being and he can resist those bullets. I just collect everything. Heart. With the smokes in them. I gave them back to him. Godwin, you want to try something else? Here. He collapsed. And when they eventually revived him, pick on his heels and run away. He forgot he was a soldier. Satan at that stage was telling me that I was secured, I was protected. But I have this to tell you. Nineveh had a wall about 50 feet thick about a hundred feet high and they had a moat dug around that wall about 60 feet deep and about a hundred feet wide but when the wrath of God rose against Nineveh mortars and bricks could not withstand the wrath of God Why am I saying this? Maybe you have some kind of fortress that you have built for yourself for protection. There is no amount of fortress that you can build up for yourself that can ever protect you unless God. I have built all these things around me and I thought I have everything to myself and I can control everything at will. Until one day something strange happened. I lay down that afternoon my windows wide open there were no blinds on that window. And I saw a dove flew into my room from that window, which was a bad sign for me as a magician. You can pick a dove in the cage or anything, it's not a bad sign. But when a dove just fly into where you live, that is telling you that you will soon die. That was a superstitious belief. And because they believe in it, it happened like that. Now, there is something I want you to understand here. That bird, the dove, like the Bible, take it as the symbol of the Holy Spirit. God knows what he is doing. I was a magician. I practiced sacred magic, black magic, white magic, 
Kwabala magic. I know of many pentacles and characters that we can use to evoke demons to appear in different forms. In form of a human being, in form of a bird, in form of an animal, in form of a snake, in form of a stem, and the rest of it. But there's no symbol, no magical character will make you evoke a demon to appear in the form of a dove. No one. That bird is so protected by God that the devil cannot use it. So when you, as a sacred magician, will see a dove flying into your house where you live, then get prepared to die. So when I saw this dove flew into my room, I believed that was the end of everything. I believed the end was come. Then I said, okay, you dove, before you kill me, I'm going to kill you first. Then I began to chase this dove all around, all over in my room. And all of a sudden, this dove came up there and bank on something up there and said, You want to kill me? What evil have I done? I was shocked to death to hear a bird talking with the voice of human being. He repeated that again. You want to kill me? What evil have I done? And I said, Because God created you to stay in the bush. What have you come to do in my room? That's why I want to kill you. That's the evil you have done. And he goes, I'm going away. I'll be back again tonight. Oh, a dove in the night. I've never seen that in my life. I only know of an owl. An owl can fly in the night. They don't see in the daytime, but their eyes are open at night. But I've never seen a dove flying about in the night. He eventually flew out of the window, went away. I became so troubled. Because that grip was in my heart that, hey, man, this is the end of everything. You're going to die. And I actually died. If only you can understand what I'm talking about. I actually died. And this is how it happened. In the night, I look at my clock on the wall. It was precisely one o'clock. But just before I was converted, there was a quarrel between two of the members in one of the occult groups I belonged to. What actually happened was that the man who was holding the office of Aquina, he died. Then I was the Otunawo, that is the second in command to the leader, Oluwo. Two brothers of the same family. Uh, father began to hunt each other with the native shans because each of them wanted the vacant office or, or the vacant post. They want to become the Aquino. We did all we could to settle the quarrel, but they refused to agree. The younger of the of the two argued that he was the first to become a cult member before his senior brother joined the group, but. The senior brother claimed to be older in age, and he was wealthy too, of course. And you know what money cannot do. I'm not sure anything can do it in this generation. The case became so difficult and complicated for for the rest of the members, those that are in authority, most especially the Iwarefa of Ogboni. It became so difficult for them and became so complicated as these two brothers started to sham and harm themselves with their remote powers, remote control. So I called everybody and said, well, if you will not settle these differences, I no longer think that I could be a member of this society. And I decided to stay on my own. When they saw that I really meant what I had said, and realizing my contributions to the group, they started seeking for a way to bring me back. But it was too late. I have already made up my mind. After they had tried unsuccessfully for some time, they turned to the secret means of using shams to harm me. They tried all that they could, but they failed. Well, one of the nights I was sleeping in my room and when at about 1 a.m., I had a voice calling me through the window saying, Professor Shankar, the daily, that is Professor Shankar, rise up. 
In those days, I don't normally close the windows of my room because there was no thief that was bold enough to come and steal or boggle my house. Such a thief would sweep the ground till he dropped dead. Because as he sweep, it will, I mean, the, the, the evil spirits will keep making it dirty and dirty and dirty and dirty again and again. But immediately I heard the voice, I replied, That is, meaning, if, if you call a dead person on the street, it is another man's child that will answer that call, if he has the same name. So I said, I, I mean, I, I said this, I, I reply in that form, thinking that someone evil-minded wanted to use a sham known as Akweta to call and kill me. However, I heard the voice again, this time calling me by my real name, and he, he, he asked me to stand up. I replied to him, Ewa, Ijiki Jakobwe, Wanola Leome, that is, it is forbidden. When the storm rages, it can never move the small snail under the sea. The voice sounded yet again, Call my name, and commanded me, Stand up, stand up, I said, Stand up. Then I became weak and weary and tired, and uh, I was fed up with the repeated calls. Therefore, I chanted one incantation with the aim that after finishing that incantation, the witch or the wizard or the, or the witch doctor I thought were behind the matter will cease. The incantation says, Ah, Odawa Gude, Odawa Gude, Odawa Gude Gude. Olorieyetinfolodumareshiwajodowajagumolitinsholuwodeorun and so on and so on and so on and so on. Because it's a very, very long incantation. On finishing these incantations, I felt confident that the trouble was over, and I went to sleep. But as I was just trying to doze off to sleep, I heard the voice call me yet again. Then I recited another terrible incantation intended that the blood of the man talking to me might dry up, and consequently he should die. I said, Iwatani, that is who are you? Monico ma shemi o lo shemi ewure to lo won shemi ase o edidudu agunto to lo won shemi ko le pa so ishi da lorun igbe to lo won fe shemi iyan o leje e oro to lo won fe shemi iyan na papa bara yan to lo won fe shemi iyan o loro won ni wo wo le na wo iwe wo ke je ara ya o gbeda na ko ku loro been interpreted who are you i say you should not harm me you say you insist that you will harm me the goat which will harm me, the, 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 the coat of, of such a goat has turned black. The sheep that will harm me could not change its skin of yesteryears. The snail that will harm me has no blood. The cockroach that will harm me has no sting. The hare that will harm me ha has run to hide away in the bush. May your blood dry up and you die standing. In spite of this incantation, the voice again called me. So I challenged him. Just show yourself to me, and now I will show you that man past man, position past power. And he answered and said, In your yo habile dara jabi, which is being interpreted, interpreted, shall a man fight against his creator? Creator? What do you mean? What has the creator got to do with all of this? Who are you? I said. I question. Who are you? And what I heard terrifies me. And the voice says, I am that I am, the immortality that dwells in the light. You are that you are, immortality, I can't understand. What are you talking about? Then I, I had wanted to take another dangerous medicine to use. I had wanted to talk and he said, shut up. And believe me, from that moment, all the forces of darkness in my life became dead. That's why I told you that I actually died. 
Those physical things were there that you can call them shams, but the powers that were operating in them were no more. You know, sometimes it will happen that as you go along your way, you just realize that everything looks dead around you. And you begin to question God. God, why this? God, why that? God, why me? And I always tell you, if it is not you, it's not going to be anybody else. It must be you, so that God will be glorified. Dead, God wants to speak life into you. To quicken you. To make you useful for what he has proposed before the creation of the world for your life. And it happened that when all those forces in my life became dead, then he began to order me to do things. And he said to me, all those rings in your fingers, on your fingers, in those days, my fingers, my ten fingers, my ten toes has different kind of rings and these are not just ordinary rings. They are rings with charms. One kind or another. My shoulders were filled up with philateries. My waist filled up with philateries. You may not know what a philatery is. A philatery is a kind of sham that, for instance, I made a sham into a philatery and to make this sham I need the blood of 201 black cats 201 black cats and you're going to use the blood in these things and make it into a philatery wrap it up in a, a leather and sew it so that it will be long enough to go around your waist. Okay, this particular sham that I'm talking about, the uses are, are in diverse ways. I can just hold this thing, this philatery in my hand, recite a short incantation, and put it around my waist, and you don't see me no more. I, be, I, I become invisible. The same philatery, I can take it up like that, Recite a short incantation, strike it on the floor or on the ground, and you see plantains. You may not know what plantains are, but some of you will know, you know what bananas are. Okay, plantains are in the family of banana, but a little bit bigger. So both bananas and plantains will grow up right there. They just spring up. And as you look forward, wherever your eyes can see, so the plantains and the bananas will grow in those bush. Why do we do that? We do that if there is a battle or a war between two nations. I can use these shams to make me invisible. I can go into the land of my enemy and bring out this thing, strike their ground with it, and these plantains and bananas will just grow. Then I go back into my own country. What happened? As these plantains and the bananas grow up, they become ripe immediately. They become ripe, but it's a poison if you dare eat it at all. So the, the purpose is to destroy your enemies, to kill them. Because anyone who eats out of these bananas or plantain, they're going to die. And people will not know who, or who and what killed them. They will not know who and what Poison those food for them. Those are the kind of life that I was living in those days. So, and he ordered me to pull these things down, and I have to pull everything down. I used to have a rope, don't let me call it a rope, a thread, a thread across my head like that, magically made and prepared, and it carries only. Uh, I don't know if some of you are familiar with what is called cowries. You're familiar with what cowrie is? C-O-U, uh, sorry, C-O-W-R-I-E. C 
cowry. Cowry was the first money that was being used in those days before metals were invented. This thing carries only three calories. And the purpose for that is, as I am here, if I have that thread on my head, and somebody is talking about me, backbiting about me anywhere in the world, all of a sudden, soon as he or she finish backbiting, there will be a temperature like fever that develops in his or her body. Before you know it, within eight hours' time, it's dead. The person will be dead. These are things that were being done by the devil, and the devil want me to believe that I was secured. But when Jesus came, Jesus said, Pull it down. And that's what I did, whether I like it or not. I pull everything down. Pull everything down. Those are my walls that I hang on the wall. I pull them down. And I have this magic bag. And that's why they call me bag of wickedness. I have this magic bag. Even though it's so small. Smaller than this. But as small as it is. If you want to put this pulpit. I mean this lectern. Inside of it. It's going to take it. It's going to contain it. It will just expand. Bang like that. And it goes in. Then. I brought out this bag and I started putting everything inside of the bag. Then something happened and I I never forget. I have this oil. It's a magic oil. When you rub this magic oil in your hand, you shake hand with a businessman and say, Oh man, your business is going to move today. And he's going to go into that warehouse where he has his business and he's going to touch those things. And the first person that comes in to buy, he's going to take the money by himself. If care is not taken, he might sell that warehouse that same day. Because those demons will begin to bring customers from nowhere. They will just go... I don't know if it has ever happened to some of you. You just find yourself going out there to buy something that you don't even need. And you never even think about it. You just go there, you buy it, and you might have got home before you realize, what am I doing? Why do I buy this thing? What do I need it for? And I want you to be assured that there are some demonic forces behind those kind of things. That's why you should never open the door for those forces to get into your life. And that's why Jesus encouraged you to pray always. Why do you have to pray always? Let me, let me get to that very briefly before I come back into what I'm telling you. Why do you have to pray always? Before I become a Christian, I do practice witchcraft. And what we do, we don't gather in the physical. What we do in the actual sense, we sleep at home, lay down at home, and get out of our bodies to get into the meeting. And this I have been doing for years. I would go into the meetings and return back home to get into my body. But something happened one day. As I went out and I was coming back, I could not find the doorway to get into the house. But I do not know what happened. Then I went to the, to the masters. We call them invisible masters. I went to the invisible masters to inquire what happened. Why is it that I cannot get into, into the house? And they told me there was somebody in that house that was using a white oration. You know what is called white oration? Your prayers. Christian prayers. That is white oration. So there was something in that, uh, somebody in that house that was using a white oration. And what happened when somebody used a white oration? Look at this. This wall, wall right here is thick. To the extent that you are material, you cannot penetrate through it unless you destroy that wall to pave way for yourself. But in the spirit realm, this wall is not a barrier. You can easily walk through. But, in the same spirit realm, if in the physical, 
This door there right there is open. That door right there is open. The windows are open in the physical. And somebody kneel down here begin to pray in the name of Jesus. Believe me. In the spirit realm, all these walls become fortified. The doors closed, locked. That no forces, no power, whatever can penetrate through. I believe that was why the Lord Jesus encouraged you to pray always. Why? Because Jesus wants you to close the doors against those forces. And prevent them from coming into you. You close the doors against them. You fortify your walls against them. That was precisely what happened. So if you are a Christian that lives a prayerful life, that is what you are doing to the demons. They will have no way of coming in. Then in those days before I become a Christian, if I'm walking on the streets, if I walk across a Christian, I know them. They don't have to tell me. If you are truly a Christian, if you are truly a child of God, you don't have to tell me. I will know. How do I know? Okay, like my sister right here, you want to come forward a little bit, would you? Get it with you. Take it with you. That's why I'm calling you. Uh Uh-huh. Thanks. What is the color of this coat, everybody? Black. Okay, even as she's having this black coat on herself in the physical, in the spirit realm, If she's a Christian, you want to come also, my brother? Thank you. In the spirit realm, from the crown of her head to the sole of her feet, her body and everything will look like the color of this shirt. White. From the crown of her head to the sole of her feet, she will be snow white. That's when I know, oh, this is a Christian. Thank you very much. You may be seated. And if you are the kind of a Christian that give your life to prayers, because the kind of a Christian I just described to you is the kind of a Christian that says, Lord, I want to do everything that is your will, but their prayer lives are weak. Those are the ones you see in a snowball form. But those that are prayerful, They're going to have a different uh, 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 sight, a different form. If you are so prayerful as a Christian, when those that are possessed with demons see you, they will be seeing fire burning around you. There will be a fire furnace burning around you. Maybe it has happened to you sometimes in the mall or sometimes on the street. You walk across some people. They just all of a sudden turn aside. They don't want to walk across you because they can see what you, even the, oh my goodness, thank you Lord Jesus. Even you, the very person that has such a power, you do not know what kind of power you have, but these people can see you. They know who you are. They don't want to be consumed because the Bible says our God is a consuming fire. They don't want to be consumed by that fire, so they have to turn away and take a different route entirely. So if you are the kind of a Christian who lives a prayerful life, there will be this fire furnace burning around you. And the more fervent you are in prayer, the wider the fire furnace around you. And that's a big lesson that the Lord has taught me before I become a Christian. I believe it was a kind of university that God has made me to pass through before I become a Christian. So that I could be able to be a blessing to the body of Christ. So I encourage your prayer life today. Be more prayerful. Because there are forces out there that you cannot even recognize. You don't know them, but they know you. And they always try to watch for the hour of your weakness. Hello? Those forces out there always like to watch for the hour of your weakness. So make sure you have enough 
in your spiritual reservoir so that when the devil comes you have a lot to offer pray always okay let's get back into the testimony now he had ordered me to pack all those things and I began to pack them and I was talking about one kind of oil the magic oil this magic oil if you rub it on your hands shake it with a businessman you say your business will go and move the business will move if you say the business will liquidate it will definitely liquidate then I said this oil could be useful to me in the future so I try to hide this oil away under my bed I have no other place to put it but under my bed and this voice says bring it out oh I said, so you can see me too because I didn't I didn't realize he can see me I thought he was just talking but after I was converted and I become a Christian I flashed my mind back into that incident and the Holy Spirit began to minister to me that that incident that happened that night indicates that we believers Christians there are some of you who has a kind of sin or another hiding in the secret closet of your heart and you never want to give it up probably because of the pleasure you derive in them but what I want to tell you is God can see you There's no way you can hide from him. He can see you. So, don't try to be a man pleaser, but God pleaser. Because that God, he knows all things. He sees all things. He can do all things. He told him to bring it out. I brought it out. I put it in the bag. And after everything had been gathered up into the bag, and he said, put it on your head. And that's a command that no man has ever given me in my life. Not even my mother. And as he commanded, I took up the bag. And that was it, in my head. Ah. But what happened is, in the physical, talking of my physical strength, I will not be able to lift this bag up to put it on my head. It's too heavy. But where that strength come from, I do not know. Don't ask me. I just realized I was able to pick it up and put it on my head. But before I go 10 minutes, because as soon as I put it on my head, he said, follow me. I said, I, I can't see you, and you ask me to follow you. How do I know where, where I'm going or where you are going? How can I follow you? He said, follow me. Then what I experienced was that if he want me to go through this door, and I was trying to go through that door, he's going to tell me, here am I, come here. But I can't see him. You know, a lot of the time, you know, th there is a great revelation here. A lot of the time, you, you, you want to see God, you want to see his footprint. To be able to follow him, step, one step after another, and when that does not happen, you become discouraged. But the Bible says, in the book of Isaiah, even though you are ignorant, the Spirit of the Lord... The Spirit of the Lord shall lead you in the way that you must follow. Now, in another word, I am saying that the success of this thing does not depend on your ability, but God's ability. All that God is demanding from you is to make yourself available. So your availability is what counts, not your ability, not what, not what you can do or what you cannot do, but are you available for God's use? And if you make yourself available, even though you are ignorant, his Holy Spirit will lead you. And if the Holy Spirit is your guide, if the Holy Spirit is your teacher, you never miss it. 
So I followed him, and after about 10 minutes, it was like a whole wagon of a train was placed on my head. Became so heavy, and I said, Lord, but with an arrogant mind. You know, it happened to us. We think we are something. We become so arrogant against God or towards God with an arrogant mind. I said, Lord, this thing is too heavy. And that gentle voice came in and cracked every stronghold that was in my heart. And he said, you can compare that with the burden of your sins. That is, you can compare the heaviness of that burden, the heaviness of that load, with the burden of your sins. Compare. Then from that point, I realized that if God will leave you alone to bear the burden of your sins all by yourself, no man will survive. Thank God for Jesus. Then I started hearing that sonorous voice as if it was from a very far distance. And it says, Jesus is tenderly calling the home. Calling today. Calling today. Before they finish that first stanza, you can see some water coming down. For the first time in my life, somebody will make me cry. I remember my grandfather used to call me a stone. Then one day I asked him, Daddy, why do you call me a stone? He said, because you never crack. But that night, the stone cracked. Then, I started following this voice as he led me. And this thing was becoming heavy and heavier every step of the way. Then I tried to push it off. I don't want it anymore on my head. I want to push it off. Surprisingly, the whole of my body was going to fall along with this body. And something was telling me in my mind that if you fall with this thing on your head, you're not going to survive. You're going to die. Until this voice led me into this cemetery, I became weak, tired, and it seems as if there were no bones in my body anymore. Hopelessly, I said, my Lord, this time with a humble heart. That is the moment that God is waiting for in your life. The moment you realize you are nothing. The moment you realize it is only God that can be everything for you. The moment you realize that you have no strength or power of your own but God. And when you turn it over to God, he takes it up. And do it for you. You know, a lot of us believers, we make these great mistakes all the time. When we have problems, instead of us turning to God, I mean, not just us turning to God, but turning the problems over to God. Instead of us doing that, we will begin to make use of every available strength and power to us. But when this available strength and powers and influence fails, instead of us to blame ourselves, we begin to blame God. I don't know if you understand what I'm talking about. You have a problem, and instead of you to go into prayers and turn it to the hand of God, Oh God, you know everything, you know everything. And you begin to use your money. Maybe, maybe your money is the power that was available to you at that time. You begin to use your money. And when the whole money was gone and exhausted, you begin to blame God. 
re- not realizing that from the beginning you have never trusted these things to the hand of God. You only try to do it with your head knowledge. God will fold his arms looking at you to your eyes looking at your heart waiting for his own time in your life. So the question now is Is it yet God's time in your heart? Or it is always your own time? Because the moment it is God's time, you will yield yourself. Like we talked about this morning, stinking self that was in you. You will yield everything unto God. And when God handles it for you, you never regret. Amen, if you believe. I yielded it to him this time. I said, my Lord, this burden is too heavy for me. Would you please help me? And I heard that voice saying, it is now that I will help you. And soon as he said that, miracles began to happen. The heavy thing that I have tried to push off will now go off by itself without any effort from my own side. God doesn't need your strength to, to be able to do things that he wants to do in your life. He doesn't need your strength to be able to fulfill those things that he had promised to fulfill in your life. All he needs from you is yield. Yield those things to him. When this heavy thing on my head drops, I, began, I started hearing that song saying, At the cross, at the cross, when I first saw the light and the burden of my heart rolled away from there by faith I received my sight and now I am happy all the day. When this thing drops down there I can hear this voice saying okay now set it on fire. I said my lord what are you talking about? I don't have a cigarette lighter I don't have matches there are no gas, no kerosene. How do you expect me to set this thing on fire? If you had told me before we left home, I should have brought those things with me. And what I heard next was, take. Oh my goodness. I wish God can let you see what I saw that night. It is good to be a Christian. When he said, take. A packet of surprise. Right down there, I saw this like a flash of light. Bang. And there was some fingers holding a box of matches. And I can see the wrist of those fingers. I can see the elbow, the shoulder, and a whole form of a body. But even though I saw it as a whole form of a body of a human being, I have no word to describe that glory. It was a glory. And I forgot he asked me to take something. And I questioned him. I said, who are you? And he said, I have told you. I am Jesus who died for your sins. If you will repent, then you will be saved. Then a kind of passion came on me that I, I begin to feel so sorry for myself. Then the more I say I am sorry, the louder my voice becomes. I am sorry, I am sorry, I am so-. I was just shouting like that and I was weeping bitterly. And he said to me, I have brought you today into this cemetery to bury the death of your sins here and to rise you up unto the righteousness of God. And you will go into all the nations where my spirit will lead you. Whosoever bless you, I will bless them. And whosoever curse you shall be accursed. 
as he was saying those things, it occurred to me, he told me to take something at least. But I forgot. Because that glory, I so much focused my attention on him. I don't want to take my eyes away. Then that taught me a kind of a, a lesson. That if you are a believer... And you cannot see Jesus Christ in, the, in your physical body while you are here. And if you fail to meet him over there, you miss everything. Because that glory I saw that night from what the Bible says, the Bible says we shall see him, not just seeing him, we will be like him. That's what my Bible says. And if we are going to be like that glory I saw that night, I want to be there. I don't care what it cost me. I want to be there. I will be willing by his grace and his grace alone to pay every price that it demands for me to be like him. If God can open your eyes for you to see what the heavenlies look like, you will want to be there. I want to make it and I will make it no matter what the enemy thinks. In short, I took that match, match box from him and I opened it and cracked one of them and I couldn't see the box anymore. And my bag and the shams busted into flames as if they were natural gas in that environment. And the whole thing burnt down to ashes, but something miraculous happened. I told you a moment ago that I will be locked up in jail, but I will escape without breaking their locks or using their doorways. What was actually doing those evil things were right in my stomach. So even if they strike me naked, I still have my power inside of me. And that's the right place where you need to put Jesus in your life. Inside of you. That even if the devil will come around to stripe you naked of everything that you think you are, you still have that Jesus right inside of you to lead you in the path of righteousness and to throw down every strongholds of the enemies. Hallelujah. The miracle that took place was the, the, the burning thing, the, the odor, the smoke, came into my nostril. And as soon as I breathed in, I had a discomfort in my stomach. Then I began to throw up. But my shock was that the food I ate last night did not come out of my mouth. But all those dangerous charms, all those medicines that I have been drinking and eating and swallowing, that's all that began to fall out of my mouth, came out of my stomach, as if I had just been eating them. Some of them I have ate for years. They came out in the same form that they went in there. It was one of the miracles I ever witnessed in my personal life. Listen, my brethren. I read in the Bible, Moses parted the Red Sea. Uh, Moses prayed there was manna from heaven that nobody cooked, but the people were able to eat. Elijah, the raven brought her bread and the rest of it. I was not there, I believe by faith. But this one that I'm telling you, it happened to me. So I'm a living witness of the power of God and of what God can do or has done in my personal life. After throwing all this thing out of my stomach, I became light than ever. Then there are some th few things that happened that I noticed. It was like my face had been the other way around. That is what it, it was like. And it, 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 it seems like somebody has come around now to turn my head into the proper position. Then my eyeballs 
It seems like the one that's supposed to be out was in, and the one that was supposed to be in was out. Then I can feel that roll in my eyeball to turn to the proper place. Then, when I lift up my head from throwing up, this glorious man that I saw a moment ago is now on the cross bleeding. Then I said, my Lord, what happened? What happened? A moment ago, I saw you in such a great glory. What happened? Even now you are naked. He said to me, don't be embarrassed that I am naked. I have agreed to be naked so that those who believe in me will have the glory of God to cover themselves. Now, there is something here that makes me like I want to cry. The most valuable thing in heaven or on earth or in any planet is the glory of God. And this only begotten Son of God has possessed this glory, but He agreed to give this glory to you soon as you believe in Him. The most valuable thing in heaven and on earth. He gave it to you. And I was there in the nation of the Bible. I read it. In the gospel according to St. John. He said. Greater love has no man than this. Now. Search the corridors of your soul right now. Do you actually love the Lord? And I ask you again and again, again and again. You think you love the Lord, but do you actually love the Lord? How far can you go to sacrifice yourself, your time, your money because of the Lord. How far can you go? Wouldn't you think of yourself first? Wouldn't, th- wouldn't you think of your, of your pleasure? Wouldn't you think of your time? Wouldn't you think of your finances before you can think of him? Can you have a greater love? Greater love has no man than this. No man. Can you have a greater love? Such your heart. Are you honest with yourself? Or you are lying to yourself? Something else that happened that night that really touched me. Soon as he said that, that he agreed to be naked so that those who believe in him will have the glory of God to cover themselves, I look at my body and it was like I had been suffering from leprosy for a century. And leprosy is such kind of a dangerous kind of a disease. I hate it. And I said, my Lord, I've never known leprosy in my life. Where do I come across this? And he said something that made me cry for a whole two weeks from that night. He said to me, are you embarrassed because you have leprosy? He said to me, That was what your soul looked like a moment ago before I came into your life. That was what your soul looked like in the sight of God. So if you are a sinner, your soul looked like the body of a leper. Your soul looked like you are suffering from a dangerous canker worm. If you are a sinner, 
and you refuse to give up that sin. And we come back to our subject. Do you really love the Lord? Do you mean what you are saying? Do you mean what you are proclaiming? Or you are just a pretender? But I have this plain truth to, te to tell you, my brother and my sisters. There is danger in pretense. Do you hear me? There is danger in pretense. If you are pretending to be what you are not, there is a danger. So are you a Christian? Are you really a Christian? Do you love the Lord? Like you want us to believe? Search your heart and be honest with yourself. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Shall we rise up in the name of Jesus? Far above all, far above all, God has exalted him far above all, crown him as Lord. At his feet humbly fall. Jesus Christ. Jesus. He is far above all. Thank you, Jesus. You know, the psalmist says something in Psalm 23 and the sixth verse. I don't know how well you understand that portion of the scripture. I will read it very quickly. Psalm 23 and the sixth verse. He says, surely, everybody says surely. surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Now, let's say this together. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Hmm. That's a strong one. Though we sometimes always read this for, un, for reading's sake or because we want to read our Bible. But what does this mean to you? To dwell in the house of the Lord. How can you dwell in the house of the Lord? Where is the house of the Lord? Is he talking of the church? This, for, uh, this walls? No. No. To dwell in the house of the Lord means for you to dwell in holiness. You hear what I'm saying? Holiness is the house of the Lord. So for you to dwell in the house of the Lord means for you to dwell in holiness. And that's why I said you need to search your heart whether you are true to what you claim to be. If you are not, holiness is lacking. And don't forget, without holiness, no man can see God. And I know you want to see him. And if you want to see him, that's the step you need to take. Dwell in the house of the Lord. Dwell in holiness. Let holiness be part and puzzle of you. Let holiness be your food. 
Let holiness be your water. Let holiness be your bed. Let holiness be your conversation. Let holiness be your world. Then God will have his way in your life. Now we want to go into prayers. You know what to pray for already. I hate to pretend to be what I am not. So just tell God to give you a pure heart. What kind of a heart? Tell God in your own words, in your own language, in the language you understand better, to give you a pure heart so that everything you do, you do it with the fear of the Lord. And if there is anything in your ways or in your life that was not pleasing to the glory of God, let God take them away and be sincere with that. Shall we close our eyes in the name of Jesus? And you begin to talk to the Lord. And God bless you as you pray. It has been written in this divine volume that who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord or who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath a clean hands and a pure heart. Tell the Lord to give you a pure heart today. A pure heart. Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.